Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, today's Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Today I want to talk for just maybe 10 or 15 minutes about facing uh, crisis, facing crisis. Uh, what do you do when you face crisis? Sooner or later, all of us uh, have a, a crisis situation in our life, something that is a, a great struggle, maybe a great challenge. Uh, you could not maybe prepare for that. Well, uh, we can prepare for it uh, in advance if we have the mindset that these things happen to, to everyone. But uh, I just want to share a text of scripture this morning uh, to seek to be of some help uh, to anyone that's either in crisis. Good morning, uh, Kenny. In crisis, if you're in crisis or you are getting ready to face one, it's often said that, that you know, we're either in the midst of a storm, uh, we're getting through a storm, or we're about to go into one. So uh, good to see you all this morning. And, uh, and uh, David, good morning to you. So, yeah, this is going to be very, very brief, very quick. Um, when I say brief, quick, I need to get, get out and leave for church in a few minutes. But uh, I had a thought on my mind, and I just wanted to go ahead and share it uh, this morning. So uh, I want to talk today about being in crisis, being in crisis. Um, you know, there's a, there's a text of Scripture in the book of Peter. It says, don't think it's strange, the fiery trial that comes upon you as though something strange was to happen to you right? Fiery trial. That's a, you know, there are trials and then there are trials that are at a greater level, right? Um, and so I want to just give a, a little bit of, um, a little bit of, uh, a little nugget of wisdom, you could say, on what to do and how to deal with, with trials and difficulty uh, in life because they always happen, all right? So sooner or later, uh, and I'll post this later, okay? But sooner or later, you'll experience a crisis, and how you meet it will determine your future joy and or success. So if you're not in the midst of a crisis right now, sooner or later you will face a crisis. You will face a crisis. And the way you meet that crisis will determine your future joy or success. Morning, Doug. Good to see you. A closer look will reveal that most crisis situations, and we'll put that in quotes, are opportunities to advance or stay where we are. Say, let me say that again. Most, most crisis situations are opportunities to advance or to stay where we are. In fact, most changes in our life will take place out of two things, either out of inspiration or out of desperation. Most change in our life will take place out of inspiration or desperation. A precious stone cannot be polished without friction, nor humanity perfected without trials. Now, if you are a reader of the scriptures, you know the idea of going through trials is considered normal, right? That uh, through much tribulation, the scripture says, we must enter the kingdom of God. Job says, man that is born of woman is full of trouble, right? And so what do you do when... You face a crisis. What should you do? What can you do? All right. So the first thing I think you need to do is embrace that crisis are normal. And we get this language from uh, Peter's words. In uh, Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus, he says as he's seeking to encourage the suffering church in the first century. First Peter 4, verse 12. Matter of fact, let me pray quick before I read this text. Father, I want to thank you for the entrance of your word. It gives light and it gives life. And Lord, for these next few moments, as we look into the scriptures, I pray that someone would receive encouragement from the word of God. Lord, your word is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I just pray specifically, Lord, for those who may be in crisis right now or getting ready to face crisis. Lord, that your presence, your power, your wisdom, your spirit will be with them. And Lord, that they will have what they need, that your grace would be sufficient to take them through that storm. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lisa, good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you, Lisa. Always good to see you. So, what do you do when you hit a crisis, when you face a crisis, when you find out that one of the kids in your ch child's school commits suicide and your child is depressed and you don't know what to do next? What do you do when you find out that maybe someone in your family overdosed? Right? What do you do? These are hard things. 
What do you do when a loved one dies? Death is never something that we should be comfortable with. The Bible calls death the last enemy. And so you should never be comfortable with death. You should never be... Um, death should always shake you up. Right? Even if it's a death of an animal. The closer you are to that animal, the more that's going to affect your life. Don't be surprised by that. God expects you to be shaken up by these things. Right? Uh, this is why in, the, in, in John chapter 10, when Lazarus died... Mary and Martha were so shocked that Jesus did not appear to be moved by Lazarus' death. Now, Jesus was moved. And later on, he cried at the death of Lazarus, right? He wept, right? But death is not something you should be comfortable with. What about, you know, maybe a house catch on fire and you lose everything? These things happened or happen all the time. These are happening, right? The Bible says, don't lay up treasures on earth where thieves break in and steal, I shouldn't, be con I shouldn't be surprised if someone breaks into my house. I should pray for God's protection. I should ask him to place angels around my house. I do that all the time. Uh, you could think that's wacko, crazy, charismatic chaos. Think whatever you want. I, the Bible says, pray, lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil. I pray that every day. I play for a hedge around my children. The Bible says there was a hedge around Job. I don't think there's a hedge around every child of God. I do believe there's a hedge around us when we live in a manner that pleases God. But I also believe that what we pray, that God hears us, and I don't fully understand it all, that God could know what we need before we ask Him, and yet we still have to ask Him. He gets glory. Think of it this way. If God answered your prayer before you asked Him, how does He get the glory out of it? How does He get the glory? If he answers the prayer that you asked him for, then he gets the glory because you could say, you know, I asked God, like I was talking to uh, a pastor's wife yesterday and him and his wife and a good friend. Um, uh, and um, the, uh, the pastor had left his glasses at a diner uh, about a week ago, right? Not his glasses, his gloves, one of his gloves at a diner about a week ago. And uh, this glove was important to him and her. And so his wife, his wife, um, prayed a week later, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to find the glove. I pray that it would still be there. Now, this doesn't make logical sense. It doesn't make sense that, that a week later, the glove that you left would be found in the same place that you left it, in the seat where you sat. A common sense would say, logic would say, that more people are going to sit in that, that seat before you get there. And so the glove is probably going to be gone. And probably, logic would probably say, that go to the lost and found. But they went to the same diner and sat in the same seat, and guess what? The glove was right there. Have you ever lost something, and you know you searched everywhere for it? And then you prayed, and you found it somewhere that you looked three or four times already? I've had it happen to me often, right? Uh, and I don't know, sometimes I think, like, maybe, you know, when I was younger, I, I would think that the enemy tried to extol whatever it was, and God put it back, you know, when I was younger in the faith. I don't know. The Bible says we should have childlike faith. I don't know that I think, I don't think those things now. But my point is God answers prayer, right? So back to this thing of crisis, crisis. Crisis is normal. Crisis is something you're going to deal with in life. If you live long enough, you're going to face crisis. There's going to be a death in the family. There's somebody's going to have a terminal disease. Um, maybe the loss of a job. There's different levels of crisis. By the way, when it comes to God, I said to this couple or this wife yesterday that I'm grateful that with God, nothing is too small with him. Now, you may think something is too small to ask God for or about, but nothing is too small for Him. Just like with our children, my children, nothing is too small. I'm actually bothered when my children go through something on their own, and they don't come to me for advice, for direction, for support, for provision. That they didn't come to me, and they needed something that I could have helped them with. That bothers me as a father, right? And maybe it bothers you as a parent. And so think of God in the same way, all right? So James says in... 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. That's James, that's uh, Peter's way of saying, when you hit crisis or you hit great tribulation or great difficulty or challenges, don't be surprised by them. One way to deal with crisis, one way to deal with crisis in advance, I just realized my phone is unplugged again iPhones. They die every second. That's the only thing I don't like about Apple. Give me a second. I'll be right back. Okay, back. 
when you are dealing with challenges, crisis, one of the ways to deal with crisis is uh, don't wait until the trial or, or thing hits your life, right? You should not wait for it to hit. You should prepare yourself in advance. So the first way to deal with it, if you're not in crisis now, is to arm yourself. That's a language that you use in the Bible. Put on the armor, right? The idea of arming yourself is to prepare in advance. Um, soak your mind with Scripture and verses of Scripture that, that remind you that crisis is normal, right? That, that uh, um, you know, a preacher that I like, he would always say, that which costs nothing is worth nothing. And, excuse me, the Bible says that our faith must be tried. In 1 Peter 1, 7, it says, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, that it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let me paraphrase that for you. What that saying is, James, Peter says, sometimes we have to go through crisis or our faith must be tried so that we can know that it's a genuine faith. You know that there are a lot of people who think they're okay with God that will find out when they stand before him that they're not okay? One of the best ways to know you're okay is that when the storms of life come, the rain, the Bible gives the metaphors of the rain and the storm during the parable of the sower. When the storms of life come, when crisis hit and you're able to endure, you're able to persevere, you're able to stand and having done all to stand, you stand having the armor of God on, that's one way to know that you or have a genuine faith. See, our faith is not genuine if it's not tested, or we don't know that it's genuine until it's tested. So James says, don't think it's strange. Not James. I keep saying James. I've been in James this past week. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't treat it as if it's something strange that's happened unto you. Right? The Bible says there is no temptation there hath no temptation taken us, but that which is common to man. Now, in the Old English, temptation here is not just being tempted to sin. It also has the idea of being in a trial, in a storm, in a difficulty. There is no temptation, it's a broad word, that any of us can face. There's no struggle that you can face that, someone has not been, that somebody else has not been through before and that someone else is not going through right now. Kimberly, good morning. Good to see you, as always. So... What I want to do is something a little different this morning as I get ready to, to, let, to wrap up and leave because i got to get to church for nine. Um, any of you have a question about a storm or trial? Anybody in crisis? Maybe you yourself or somebody else and you have a question on dealing with it. What can you do? We've been talking this past week about wisdom and how when you are in trial that you should ask God for wisdom. And I've been making the case that it doesn't matter what we're dealing with or facing, in this case, any crisis, that the wisdom of God can't give us what we need to help take us through that. I have to remind you, there's a lot of preaching today that gives the impression to God's people that when we go through difficulty, that God will always take us out. Many times he will take us out. But remember that Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And he gives this long list of things right, that cannot separate us? Well, if they can't separate us, that means that we at times experience them. And if you have the mindset that life as a Christian, life in this life should be easy, you are not arming yourself. And when crisis come, you may be shipwrecked, you may give up, you may throw in the towel, you may despair, you may be overcome with depression, discouragement. Brother Ron, good to see you. But when you embrace the fact that trials, crisis, difficulty at times, we all face them, then I think that gives us what we need. So let me read this to you again. I'm going to post this later. Valerie, good morning. Good to see you this morning. So again, sooner or later, sooner or later, if you're not doing it now, and this is not, this is not a negative, pessimistic thought. This is truth and reality. Sooner or later, you and I will experience a crisis. And how you meet it will determine your future joy and or success. Do you know that the way you face the future crisis in your life can affect your future joy? The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is why Satan will do everything he can. The world and the flesh will do everything it can or they can also to undermine our joy, to destroy our hope, 
our faith so that we don't have joy because the joy of the Lord gives us strength to persevere and to endure. So you have to protect, you have to guard your joy. You have to raise up the shield of faith, right? Raise up the shield of faith. The Bible says lift up the shield of faith. In other words, there's something we have to do. Donovan says he's being blessed by your sharing. Oh, that's nice. Hey, Sanda, Sanda, I haven't seen you guys in years. You guys are supposed to be coming to visit us soon. Or maybe we have to visit you. I'm looking forward, looking forward to that. So I'm sharing all this this morning because over the years, I've been a Christian for, for many years, more than 25 years now. And over the, over the years, I've seen so many of God's people give up, go shipwreck, quit, uh, throw in the towel, become demotivated, drop out of ministry, want nothing to do with the things of God because they hit a crisis. And I have a good friend that was on fire for God, and, um, and then his wife left him. And, uh, and that's, I don't know, at least maybe 15 years ago or more. And up to this day, I don't think he's walking with God today, right? What happened there? What happened there? Uh, at least partly, his expectations were wrong. So he expected things to go well as a Christian. And if he understood in 1 Corinthians 7 that they that marry will have trouble, that every marriage has trouble. You know, I'm glad. That's one of the things I understood before I got married. I didn't go into marriage with this idea that she's a Christian, I'm a Christian, we love the Lord, oh, everything's going to be great. No, it's not. No, it's not. The two must become one. Becoming one is very difficult. I have a twin brother, right? And uh, him and I don't see, the eye to, don't see eye to eye on many things. But I don't divorce him after we have a fight. I don't quit and say, I'm done with you, right? And I'm not knocking anybody that's been divorced. I'm just saying, when you go into situations with the mindset that it's going to be diff difficult, if you start a business and you go in that it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, it's not going to be easy, it's going to take a few years to make a profit. And even when I'm making a profit, crisis may hit. If you go in with the right mindset, you'll have what you need to endure, right? So sooner or later, you'll experience a crisis. Embrace this truth. And how you meet that crisis will determine your future joy and or success on the other end. God took Job through a crisis. God took Daniel through a crisis. He took Joseph through a crisis. Moses, 40 years in the desert. Paul, many crises, right? God took them through them. He didn't always take them out of them. If you expect always to be delivered, and that deliverance means that God is going to rescue you, you miss chance for spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, relational growth. See, you can't grow without tension. You can't grow without situation and difficulty that you have to persevere through. So sooner or later, you and I are going to experience crisis, and how we meet that crisis will determine our future joy or success. A closer look at your crisis. If you slow down long enough and you look at it, you can learn from it, observe, right? Just as Proverbs 6 says, look at the ant, you slug it, and you'll gain wisdom. Boy, if you stop and stop, if you don't complain in the midst of that crisis, in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that challenge, if you don't complain, if you don't murmur, if you learn to be thankful in it and for it, right? Both, both commanded in Scripture. One says in Thessalonians, says, in everything give thanks. In Ephesians, it says, for everything give thanks. You need the wisdom of God to know what to thank God for in the crisis, right? In it and for it. The more you are thankful, the more your vision is cleared, right? The more your vision is cleared, and the more the vision is cleared, the more you can see the opportunity in that crisis, right? My wife has gone through, you've, many of you have heard me say this, uh, a cancer three times. I suspect she'll say to you today, if she was here, right, meaning here, meaning on this video, that she would say to you that she won't change it for anything, that she prays God for going through that storm. You know, I went through the loss of a business in uh, like 2000, 2001, they put my family and I $100,000 in debt. It was one of the worst things that happened to us within a two-week period. My wife was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, though those were very difficult periods and some of the worst periods of our life, I, w I won't change it now that I look back. Because there's things that I glean, that I learn, that we learn, that we gather through that process that help us. So my point here is that the way you and I face crisis will determine our future joy and our success. A closer look at the crisis will reveal that most crisis situations are opportunities. They're opportunities for what? To advance or to stay where we are. To advance or stay, right? The Me Too movement is huge right now. 
right? Very huge. And I, I don't personally believe that every woman that has have accused some man of harassing her or whatever today, that all of them are true. But I'm sure many of them are. And there should be empathy and other things for those situations. But it's very, very sad. This stuff has been going on for centuries, centuries, not this years, not this is not all, this is not new. Uh, the people in power taking advantage of people that, that, that are under their subjection, right? It happens all through the world, and it's so sad. But do you know that many of that those, those women will all respond differently to those crises in their life? You know, Oprah went through crisis in relation to sexual uh, abuse, right? And the way she approached what she went through, I believe, has everything to do with the success and her ability to advance on the other end, where someone else will be paralyzed. And I want to be very careful. I'm, not being, I'm trying not to be insensitive to anybody that goes through great struggle or difficulty, because I can name many more things that I have or we have gone through, have been through. But the way you face it is going to have a lot to do with you, whether you stay where you are, paralyzed, complaining in the wilderness for 40 years, and saying, why did God put me in this wilderness? And God's saying, I gave you an 11-day journey, and if you were thankful for me along the path, thankful to me along the path, and you followed my commandments and obeyed what I said, you would have come through that storm on the other end, and I would get the glory, and it would be for your good, right? So, the way we face these crises are opportunities to advance or stay where we are. In fact, most changes in my life and your life will take place out of two things. Most changes will take place out of inspiration, you sat under teaching, preaching, a book you read, a song you heard, uh, something uh, inspired you to move and take action, uh, or desperation. I believe most change comes through desperation. I don't believe inspiration is, is strong enough often. I believe we can be inspired, but often we lack the follow through to, to take action. And so desperation, you know, often is a major factor. A precious stone cannot be polished without friction, nor humanity perfected without trials. All right? Sooner or later, you and I will experience a crisis. How you face it has a lot to do with what the outcome is going to be. Don't think it's strange when you go through a trial or a difficulty. Just embrace it. I read a lot of books of people who don't believe in God. Atheists, agnostics, right? I don't go out to read atheists and agnostics books. I, I read a lot of business books, a lot of books on marketing and all that type of stuff because I own a marketing firm. But I'm always amazed by the amount of people that don't believe in God, that don't follow God, that are able to persevere without God. And I, and I say that in quotes, right? We can't do anything without God. We, he gives us breath, right, and everything else. But my point is they don't acknowledge God. They don't follow the Bible. They don't have scriptures to encourage them. They don't have a choir to sing to lift their spirits. And on and on I can go, right? And I don't say this to knock the church. But I look at the world that does not have God and see them persevering without him. And I say, if they can do it without God, how much more should you and I be able to do it with him? All right. Be encouraged today. Gloria, good to see you. David, I am grateful for God and you always. This message is on point for me. Thank you, brother. Uh, you know, I was tempted not to speak or say anything today because i got to get out of here in like five or ten minutes to get to church. But God bless you all. Have a good day today. Remember, this is the day the Lord has made. The psalmist says, let us rejoice and be glad. Uh, if you look at David's life, David went through many crises, many. But he still learned how to, how to stir up himself to thank the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord, to give God praise. And when you do that, I believe, by the way, that you and I can change our emotions I believe you can change your emotions. I believe you can change how you feel, right? You can change how you feel, but you have to speak. You have to praise. You have to open your mouth. You have to engage your physical body. You can't just think, I want to be grateful. I want to be thankful. That's why the Bible uses phrases like, as I end here, shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. That shout means open your mouth. <laughs> shout, hallelujah. Believe it or not, it's hard to do that when you're very, very discouraged. Do it 10 times, right? Anthony Robbins, want nothing to do with God, as far as I know, right? Anthony Robbins will give examples of him being really down, feeling depressed in spirit, and he will just start jumping up, doing jumping jacks. Maybe he'll do 25, 30 push-ups. He'll get, sorry, sorry, I just got a call. So he'll get his body engaged, 
And in the moment that he gets his body engaged, all of a sudden his feelings change, right? He doesn't feel like getting up to speak. He got thousands, hundreds of, maybe 10,000 people in front of him, and he doesn't feel like he has what he needs to give them in the moment. And he does some physical stuff. He shouts out, screams, ah! whatever. He may look stupid, so what? And then he feels better. Well, the Bible says, shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. The shout is always shouting into the victory. The shout, you don't shout when you, when you have the victory. You shout before the victory because you believe the victory is yours, right? Um, and this is an interesting study to look at if you just look up the phrase throughout the scriptures. Often they shouted not after they won the battle. They shouted in confidence that God was with them, with them and they would win the battle. All right. So God bless you all. Seiko, good to see you. I'm going to call you right back. I see you were trying to call me. Um, I, had to, I had to deny the call because I'm on live. So God bless you all. Uh, remember that we all face crisis in life sooner or later. God is able to keep you in the midst of that crisis, but you have, to, you have a responsibility to seek him, to praise him, to rejoice in him, to thank him, to not wait and th until things change to do the right actions. Do the right actions, and then, then, then your situation uh, either will change or the way you see it will change. Rejoice in the Lord always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Three things you and I can do in the midst of any situation, and we'll find that God grace, God's grace meets us right where we are. God bless you. Have a great mor morning, and I uh, hope you have a good day in the Lord.